Hello, and welcome to the virtual Scandinavia House in New York and today's book talk, The Stranger Guide, Scandinavia Exploring the North. The panel discussion with the Sami photographer, Carl Johan Utzi, the Icelandic author, Andi Stam Malmesen, the translator, Leighton Smith, and Stranger Guide's editor-in-chief, Kira Brunner Don, and moderated by Ethleen Whitmire. The Stranger Guide is a publication that reveals the intricacies of lo locales across the globe th through both local and foreign eyes. Each print guide delves deep into a single location featuring writers and photographers from those regions and from everything from sports and economics to literature and fashion. Feel free to ask questions to the panelists in the chat function below, and I will put links there to where you can purchase the Stranger Guide as well as the discount code. You'll just need to use the code MSCAN at checkout to receive a discount. The panel is being recorded and made available on our website, scandinaviahouse.org, as well as our YouTube channel. Before we get to the panel, I would like to introduce Abby Rappaport, the, uh, the editor of Stranger Guide, to introduce the guide and to uh, more on what work, what kind of work they, they, they do. Uh, please welcome Abby. Thanks, and I'll, I'll just say I'm the publisher. I'll let, I'll let our editor uh, uh, speak to the, sorry. Edit, to the editorial <laughs> mission. Um, but thank you so much, Kyle. I just wanted to say we're you know very excited to be here and honored to partner with the Scandinavian American Foundation. Um, many thanks to Kyle, to Sally, and to everyone there who provided so much help as we were putting, to guide this, uh, putting together this guide. Um, as Kyle said, uh, Stranger's Guide is a quarterly publication devoted to stories for the globally curious readers. Um, and each volume dives deep into a single location with stories that range a great deal and by authors and photographers from the location. Um, we also have a great website. We also have a great weekly newsletter that um, dives into a different theme across a lot of places each week. Um, I'll let our wonderful editor talk more about what we do um, and about our Scandinavian guide in particular, but I just have to brag a little bit, even though this is uh, our Scandinavia guide, and I know that's a, a little outside the, the realm of, of uh, Scandinavian ethos, but um, last night, uh, Strangers Guide actually won two national magazine awards, one for general excellence in politics, science and literature, and the other uh, for general photography. Um, we were up against the Atlantic, GQ, New York Magazine, and it was, um, it was a pretty amazing feat for a small independent publication. Um, we're the only group to win multiple awards besides ProPublica and The New Yorker. And I wanted to share that because I think we, we really believe the work we're doing is unique and valuable. We really hope that everyone here um, will check us out and, and look at more of this kind of global storytelling. Um, and we're excited to kick things off now. So with that, I'll, I'll turn things back to Kyle, but thank you all so much. And we're really excited for uh, the discussion today. Okay, so I'll introduce the panel now. So moderating the panel is Ethleen Whitmire. She's a professor and chair of the Department of Afro-American Studies at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. She is a former American Scandinavian Foundation fellow, a Fulbright scholar at the, and a Fulbright scholar at the University of Copenhagen and a recipient of a grant from the Lewis Roth Endowment and Scan Design for research related to her current research project, African Americans in 20th Century Denmark. She is the author of Regina Anderson Andrews, Harlem Re Renaissance Librarian. Carl Johan Utzi is an award-winning photography from Jokmok, Sweden, which is in the far, very far north of Sweden. He's a Sami, he's also Sami, he is, and he works as a reindeer herder in the Surges Sami reindeer herding community. Andy Snell Magnuson is one of Iceland's most celebrated writers. He has won the Icelandic Literary Prize for fiction, children's fiction, and a nonfiction. And in 2019, uh, he co-directed the documentary Dreamland, which is based on his book, Dreamland, a self-help manual for a frightened na a nation. Leighton Smith's uh, most recent translation from Icelandic is Andy Snell Magnuson's book on time and water, which was published in, in the US in 2021. Uh, and in the UK in 2020. His translations have been, uh, have, his translations have twice been finalists for the Best Translated Book Award in the United States in 2018 and 2019. And he is the 2019 National Endowment, for, uh, Endowment for, of the Arts Literary Translation Fellowship recipient. And finally, Kira Brunner Don is the editor in chief and co founder of Stranger Guide. She has worked as a magazine editor in New York for 17 years and as a journalist in Eastern European and the 
as a journalist in Eastern Europe and, and in the Baltics. She has studied photography at the New School's graduate faculty and has worked as a think tank at Columbia University before, uh, before joining Latvins Quarterly where she was the executive editor for eight years. She is a co-editor of the books, uh, The New York, the New Killing Fields, Massacre and the Politics of Intervention, and is a founding co-director of the Oakland Book Festival. Please welcome our panelists. Thank you. Okay. Was Kira going to start or should I just jump right in? Oh, jump right in. Yeah, <laughs> okay. All right. So I, I, as I was telling the panelists, I just arrived here yesterday in Copenhagen to make this very authentic. I decided to go to Scandinavia. I'm actually teaching a course through DIS program about my book, African American Expats in Denmark. And I'll start with the first question for Carl Johan. Uh, in this beautiful photo essay, you're taking pictures of your own community. How do you navigate your role as both a member and as an observer, uh, do you see these roles in tension with each other or complementary? Hello, everybody. Uh, Hi. Really nice to be here. I'm very honored to be on this panel and, of course, very honored to be published in this beautiful and very interesting magazine. Um, even though I live far, far up north, for some people, <laughs> it's uh, we're following like uh, global politics and especially American politics. So it's uh, like a personal interest for me. So that's why it's really fun to be uh, published in the US. Um, and excuse me. Oh, anyway, and. Um, uh, Um, so to back to the question, uh, as a Sami member of the Sami community and the reindeer herding community, which is uh, a very small, tight community, everybody kind of knows everybody, especially as I worked as a journalist and a photographer and all kinds of entrepreneur in, in Sapmi. Sapmi is the land that we, that we call our own land it's uh you know as you know uh land in four different countries finland sweden norway and russia but uh still we i still most know most of the people here if if you can say it like that um and uh you have to work really carefully uh if you want to be and I'm kind of envious of those people coming here. I help a lot of documentaries, uh, commercial shoots, and just the, all the different kinds of journalists and filmmakers. And they can just jump in and be really close up and tight to people searching for that perfect shot or that certain feeling. Uh, and, you know, just vanish and just publish their work and they don't have to have any personal relations to these people afterwards uh, and, and they don't care if how, how their relations are later on and as you understand I have to work in a different way because uh, I have to <laughs> keep my relations to them uh, Sapmi and the Sami people are as I said a small kind of clan-like society in some ways and and uh, you have to be able to navigate within that. But uh, luckily for me, I'm, I'm born into, a, I have a lot of relatives and uh, on both my mother and father's side. And, and my fiance is from the northern part of Finland. So my Sami kind of area expanded over there also. <clears throat> which makes it easier to get in contact and take photos of, of the things I want. But I mean, it's a double-edged thing. It's uh, sad that I cannot shove the camera or film camera far up in, like, in their faces, capturing really sensitive moments. But uh, 
also you are invited to a closer closer circles and more closed uh, places which makes it of course maybe better photos but uh, it's really hard to to know if it works out so that's why i'm really happy to to see that people all the way from across the atlantic can see some value in it and and publish it thank you thank you so much i was going to ask andre the next question uh, how do you see the change but first you can also just talk generally about your contribution to the the issue but also how do you see the changes in political leadership particularly in the united states impacting the climate crisis so for people who haven't seen the issue, you can just give an overview of your piece. Beautiful issue. Hello, am I muted? Nope, I can hear you fine. Okay, super. So uh, great meeting you all. It's an honor to be here. Um, so I would uh, actually, I, I just signed a book yesterday to, uh, to uh, that, that a friend of mine is passing on to a, a certain political uh, political leader in the, I'm not sure if you can see it. It's uh, it's to a guy called Joe. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so so I'm I'm very happy that uh, that you did get new leadership in America because it does matter for the whole planet. And I think people in the Nordic places where uh, ice is on the melting point. Uh, really, uh, really matters if it's the permafrost of, uh, of the Sami people or the uh, glaciers of Iceland. It just, it just, it it matters everything, and uh, and for the world also for uh, yeah for Africa for for places where uh, wet bulb temperatures might reach uh, on uh, human limits in the next fifty years. I just think it's uh, it's a fundamental change, and I think America has to advance. Just like uh, America can do the greatest things on the planet, or uh, kind of scientific accomplishments, uh, if they become a climate leader of renewable energy and solutions, uh, the world kind of depends on that because America is currently having a very bad footprint and uh, and uh, and has not been a very good example of consumption and and uh, and recycling and you know all these issues have have been quite messy in America so uh, I think uh, the, the rest of the world relies on America to to really get its grip on this but of course the events are scary like because America did not change even though it did get a new president there are there are forces in America that uh, I feel are worrisome. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit about the piece that you wrote and the focus of it and what, what inspired you to write that for Stranger's Guy? Uh, I have to admit, I actually don't know what I have in the magazine. <laughs> can can Litton remind yeah. me? Your translator could speak to that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Not, you know, and, and, and it seems fitting for, you know, sort of uh, me to join and Andrew at this moment. And so um, it's a it's a beautiful um, excerpt from um, Andrew's new book on, on, uh, on time and water. And it's called In Search of the Lost Glaciers. And it it really sums up Andrew's project here, which is um, uh, this really up to the minute work about the importance and urgency of, of climate change and, and talking us through the disappearance of glaciers and ocean acidification um, and, and managing to be really hopeful in doing that, right? Um, which is a translator I was grateful for because I was often translating this late into the night and wondering where this was all headed. Um, but alongside that, in, in, in a way that I think is quite unique and, and perfect for Stranger's Guide as a magazine, um, is it's also a deeply personal story, right? Where Andrew's telling us connections to, to his grandparents and their role in research on the glaciers and um, his own experiences of sort of being out there in the landscape. Um, and um, one of the things I love about Stranger's Guide as a concept and, and a magazine is, is that wonderful way where Stranger's Guide, you know, you can read it many ways, right? Is it the stranger as a guide? Is it a guide for strangers? Um, and Icelanders have a, have a saying um, maybe over repeated that clear are the eyes of the guest. And, and so Stranger's Guide seems to be absolutely 
tapping in, into into that um, uh, aspect of things. If I can add, so what Iceland is of course experiencing is uh, nature leaving geological speed and entering human speed. So I'm, I'm using my grandmother as a uh, measuring stick because she's 97 years old this summer. And I can ask her, are 100 years a long time or a short time? And, and she can tell me that 100 years are a short time when they have been lived. Uh, but for a strange reason, culturally, we feel uh, 100 years irrelevant. Uh, economics can't really measure uh, investments, uh, anything worth anything in 100 years. It's just it doesn't measure in modern economics, even though we all know that people will exist in 100 years and, and, uh, and need to live and prosper. So, uh, so. Uh, so now the glaciers in Iceland that seemed eternal when my grandmother and grandfather were exploring them in the 50s, uh, they will vanish within the time someone is born today, becoming as old as my grandmother is now. So I'm using grandmothers as a, a time scale and, uh, and using grandmothers to understand how we will be connected to our grandchildren. Yes, yeah, so I liked how you, you wove in the stories of your families talking about this. Uh, I'll go back to Lighten. Can you tell me about how you worked with Andre and how you see your own role in regards to this original work? How does, how does it work as a translator? Besides staying up all night, what else do you do? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question and, and, and thank you for it. And it, it was a particularly interesting challenge because I think, you know, as, as a translator, you worry about your... Um, your, your duty to the, the language and the culture that you're, you're translating and you're wanting the, the reader who is reading in a new language to have as close to an experience as possible to, to the one reading in the original language, but knowing that that's, that's got to change, right? And, and so there's all of those mm -hmm. uh, anxieties that you have as a translator, but then there's also here about the, you know, also being part of Andrew's project of, of the urgency of talking about how language and climate are connected together and making sure that you're responsible to, to this great knowledge that Andrew had spent so long researching and exploring and, and finding out. So it almost felt there were two kinds of translation and I was getting a wonderful education as well um, from, from Andrew um, there. Um, I do also think that translating goes two ways. Um, I love that idea of, of relationship and translation in the sense that um, maybe we're trying to bring the reader who's reading in translation a little bit closer to the place that, that, that in this case, Andrew's writing about to take them up to the edge of the glacier so that they can be there even if, if virtually and through a book. Um, and that's happening in, at, at the same time as the, the Icelandic is coming towards say the United States or, or the UK. Thank you. And I wanted to go to uh, Kira and talk to you about um, what goes into producing each guide and how you manage during this particularly trying time during the pandemic, put it, pulling this all together. Right, thank you, Adelaide. And thank you everyone for coming and being part of this tonight. This is lovely, although it's morning for me. Um, it's really good to see everybody face to face. And that actually speaks to how we put together this guide in particular during COVID. Usually what I do as the editor is um, create a board of advisors for each issue because each issue is a separate and new place. And that board helps me come up with themes or writers that I should reach out to. And then I fly to the country or the city or that region as the case may be and meet with a lot of writers and photographers and artists and academics and sort of talk through ideas and commission the pieces. This year, of course, uh, I couldn't fly anywhere. So I did it a lot by Zoom and phone calls. And um, in fact, one of my favorite phone calls was with Carl, uh, where I remember we were talking about your photography. And at one point you moved your, your, your video so I could see outside your window that it was just covered in snow. And here I am in California. And it was sort of a kind of a magic of our technology that we could have this conversation about reindeer herding while I'm sitting on my sofa in California. Um, we, what we try to do with each issue is really put together different pieces of 
a country that show as best we can its own juxtaposition. Some of it sort of the beauty and celebration, some of it deep and hard questions. You know, we had pieces about um, uh, what's happening with the welfare state in terms of immigration. We had pieces about um, the prison system, which has been very celebrated in the United States, the Norwegian prison system. We had uh, pieces as Ethleen contributed to about music. Um, we really, our, our attempt is to put together all of those different aspects and kind of present um, a view of the country from those who are in the country, some of the best writers and photographers telling about their own space and their own place in, in their words, which is why translation is hugely important for us. And um, not just parachuting American journalists into a country, but instead going to that country and talking to the writers and artists from there and having them tell their story. Um, which I'm really pleased happened the way it did um, with this issue. You know, we have a piece by um, Jonas Hassan Kamini's, like a postcard from Stockholm. And then we have, of course, um, Andre's long, uh, beautifully written environmental piece. Um, and I also wanted to say, it's interesting, I was remembering um, uh, Carl, there was a, um, one of my favorite photos. And if you don't mind, Ethelene, I'd love to ask him a question as well, if that's all right with oh, you. Sure, of course. Um, the, one of my favorite photos from, from from the piece that we that we did, uh, the photo essay of yours is actually, I believe, this is your fiance. And did you? Uh, see no. No, no, no. <laughs> this no? is not your fiance. I'm sorry to the fiance. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. She's a she's a really good friend of mine. Ah, very. Good. I, my apologies. But she's wearing an IKEA bag. And yeah. that's been made into a dress. Oh. I wonder if you could say a little bit about the intention behind this photography and this piece. Because um, you also do that kind of work as well, not just of the reindeer herding. Yeah. Um, when you live in an extremely sparsely populated area, as the northern part of Sweden is, then you need to kind of work with a lot of things not just like editorial photo or commercial or portraits or wedding or you have to really do everything and uh, and you also need to do things other than photos too so you need to so I do also graphical design and also more and more films uh, which I don't really like I love photography but films is such a hustle to work with but sometimes I get to do this more like uh, fashion and portraits and portraits is my favorite uh, and and I do a lot of uh, and I want to do I do a lot of for some youth magazines and uh, all different kinds and they want of course some some new new mo like uh, uh, modern Sami uh, things not just clothing but music or traditional music but this this girl is a really close friend to me and my fiance and uh, she, her name is Katarina and uh, her mother is a traditional uh, handicrafts maker uh, she's been a teacher in handicrafts and this uh, young woman learned all this handicraft from her mother but of course uh, we we are now in the age of, uh, you know, everything comes down and and we do a lot of redesign. My fiance do also a lot of redesign, t t taking stuff from anything and making Sami things of it. And uh, as you probably know, there, there, were, there was an IKEA trend that you took IKEA bags and made clothes from it and she just took an Ikea bag and, and made this traditional Sami uh, dress called the Kakti and uh, uh, her mother was of course not so happy about it and also but still she helped her because uh, you know she understands it but she don't she does but she respects it and you know it's taste also in, involved but and then we did this uh, 
piece for a youth magazine, I think. But it was also uh, <clears throat> bought by the Swedish uh, cultural department because they, of course, liked it. But the perfect marriage between Swedish culture and Sami culture, you know, IKEA, the... Um, but anyway, it's a, it's a, and actually it was taken in an empty uh, swimming pool here in, here, here in Jokmok. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a bit, uh, you know, she's, uh, it's a bit uh, provocative also in many ways. And, uh, but she's, she has an extremely photogenic face also, which adds to the mix, of course, and makes it easy to, to take a photo. Well, yeah, I was so busy concentrating on her face. I, I did not even realize that was an Ikea bag. Yeah, she's, <laughs> she is very photogenic. Thank you. Uh, I was gonna turn to Kyle at the American Scandinavian Foundation. He's monitoring the chat to see if there were questions um, in the chat so far. None so far, but I have a question for you, Ethleen. Would you like to introduce your piece? Because uh, I do find it very, very interesting, especially since it does it's basically what the American Scandinavian Foundation does is building a bridge between America and the Nordic uh, countries where you are looking at music. And I wonder if you could introduce your piece at all for us. Yes, it was great to get funding to, to look at um, African-Americans in uh, Denmark. Uh, and actually I discovered this whole project by walking through a cemetery and discovering a grave that said Ben Webster. And I was thinking that's not a Danish name. Who's Ben Webster and what is he doing there? Uh, in this a famous cemetery where Hans Christian Andersen is buried in Soren Kierkegaard. And when I looked him up and found out he's an African-American jazz musician, a very famous one, and that there are many, probably about a dozen or so, who are buried in Denmark um, in the 50s, in the 60s, 70s through the 80s, uh, African-Americans went over there to perform, to sing, uh, including Ella Fitzgerald lived there for a short time period. Uh, Billie Holiday, the first time she ever went abroad in the 1950s, she went to Sweden and to, to Denmark, among other countries, and had significant experiences there. And so I got inspired to write this book about African Americans in Denmark, besides musicians, but they were one of the biggest groups to live there. Uh, during this time period when I was meeting with families, the wit up and the widows of the African Americans and their children, I met Kirsten Malone, who actually did the photographs for the, the selection. She's a Danish woman who was married to an African-American man, uh, Skip Malone, who was a journalist. He was also the representative for the Black Panther Party in Denmark. Um, and he also taught. I met one of their two children. But uh, Kirsten Malone is a photographer, has these outstanding photographs of African-American jazz musicians who went through Denmark whether living there or performing. And so she uh, provided the photos for the photo essay. And Maxine Gordon was married to arguably one of the more famous musicians, Dexter Gordon, who lived in Denmark through the 60s and the 1970s. He loved it. He said it's his favorite city in the world. Uh, she also contributed some captions and some photographs of Dexter Gordon in this photo essay. Um, and so this is just a small piece of the, the book I'm writing about African-Americans. But most people are just interested in the jazz musicians because they're kind of some of the more fascinating people who went to Denmark. Uh, and so I was glad to be able to, to share this photo essay with Kirsten and also with Maxine Gordon. Um, I mean, are there other questions that the panelists have for each other? I do have a few questions, but I don't want to take over. I was wondering if other people had questions. I, I'd be curious, um, Andre, it just, if you would be willing to go back a little bit to what you were speaking about. Um, this is my own interest as an American. Um, and this idea that, you know, we have this moment now where our president has changed. You're sending your book to our new president. And at the same time, very little has changed in what America has done in terms of its pollution. And if there's something that you actually think is possible in this moment that we're having a political change with our larger government, if there's something that you, any hope that you see or. Yeah, well, uh, we see all sorts of uh, kind of plans and uh, good intentions uh, and talks about uh, Green New Deal and uh, etc. So, uh, so of course we, you know, 
the dystopia of having uh, climate change denial at the head of uh, of, uh, of America and uh, even dismantling of, uh, of research institutions and you know that was that was very difficult you know while I was writing the book to to witness you know that was happening in America and, and the, the thought of of that process to happen even further so so I'm I'm generally optimistic still that uh, the more progressive parts of America, you could say California and uh, and the states that are really pushing pushing these issues will eventually also make the technology kind of so available that that uh, oil will fail in in comparison in and competing with with solar wind and uh, other alternative sources of energy and. Uh, the issue is both technical, that is, we need energy transition totally. And uh, often I talk to, uh, my book was very much kind of came out of discussion with American college students. So uh, I was getting, uh, they have these travels uh, every year, both both American and, and from Vancouver. So I would meet uh, meet these groups frequently. So, so the, the arts of my book, and the way of telling, telling, talking about the issue, which is weaving science and mythology and grandmothers, uh, uh, that comes from talking to the, these kids uh, or these uh, students, uh, because they would often be very pessimistic, especially during the years when, when, when things seem to be going in the wrong direction. And when they had already educated themselves about the problem, but uh, the problem was being denied in in uh, very important places in America. So I told them that the challenge is not essentially that is for the first scientists they can see that that we can meet these problems with the current technology that we have. And basically, if you're 20 years old today or, or 15, all your working life is basically about this issue. That is because almost the whole legacy of the 20th century is wrongly designed. That is our legacy of uh, consumption and highways and uh, disposable disposable resources. Uh, we found out that this isn't possible anymore. So it doesn't matter what you choose in life if you're 20 or 15 today, everything has to change. That is. Uh, if you go into fashion, fashion has to change. If you go into food, food has to change. Energy, transport, uh, design, so almost every aspect of our lives has to be radically changed in the next 30 years until emissions reach zero. And, uh, and, and then we have like 1000 gigatons of CO2 in the atmosphere that has to be removed. And nobody really knows exactly how to do that. But if we have like uh, the same advance in carbon removal in the next 30 years, as we saw in computers or uh, transistors or something, then you know you could be optimistic that as soon as we put resources and manpower and thought into that direction and work, then we will start seeing things move into the right direction. So I think that uh, if you look at the megatrends now, that is, uh, if you're 20 year old today, you will know and love somebody that will still be alive in the year 2160, if, if you become as old as my grandmother. So uh, a 20 year old, uh, somebody born today reaches the age of Biden in the year 2097. You know, imagine that. So. So this generation now has a completely different connection to this century than, for example, me, because I'm born in the 20th century and I'm still in denial that I'm reaching middle age. I, I don't want to be middle aged. I, I, I don't want the 20 year olds in the universities to be born in the year 2000 because that confronts my, my age. I, I want to be young. I, I want to be hip. But, but these kids, uh, they they are paying into pension funds to be paid in the year 2070. 
And if they look at climate data, everything is very bleak currently. Uh, so, so, uh, so basically, if I close this rant, the, uh, the, uh, if you look at the coronavirus, these kids have sacrificed their best years to save the older generation. You know, they sacrificed the, the proms and, and, the, and, and the parties and the birthdays and the school trips and the uh, spring breaks. They, they sacrificed all the fun of being young to save the older and the weaker. And I think they will see economy differently than we did because they have seen the handbrake uh, pulled. And they then have also gone through the Me Too movement where the young woman define the culture of the workplace. Mm -hmm. It's not the dirty old man that de defines what jokes are said and, uh, and what, uh, you know, so, so, and then we have had also like Black Lives Matter and, and those mm -hmm. social movements. So, so, uh, so I think uh, when all this comes together, like uh, the, the data, uh, the handbrake, the corona, the social justice movements that uh, where where uh, where the paradigm is is really pushed in a in a faster way than we've seen, I, I think we will see reframing of our, our of our current existence, uh, learning from all these movements. That is uh, mm -hmm. how we feel entitled to all of our resources uh, without with ne neglecting. Uh, neglecting the future generations, how we feel yeah. us able to colonize uh, homes and habitats of, of, of other species uh, just for uh, disposable pleasure. So I think we will see lots of cultural change in the next 10 years when this generation that is connected to the 21st century kind of starts taking power. Yeah, that's a, a good segue. I, I made me think about the piece with uh, Greta Thornburg uh, in her exchanges with, dare I say, the former president of the United States. That's also featured in here. I, I really love this issue, not just because I'm in it, but there was just a variety of things, including an overview of, of Scandinavia that a lot of Americans don't know much about to the sound bites at the very end. I was going to ask Kira, uh, what what piece surprised you the most in this particular issue um, about Scandinavia? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I think in a interesting way, I know. Um, I guess I, I I really enjoyed the piece that we did, um, Rotten in the Welfare Strait, about the destruction of um, some of the housing projects where immigrants are living. I feel that um, in America, especially, we have a huge uh, racism problem that we're constantly confronting and dealing and arguing about and getting wrong and trying to get right. Um, and I think that we have a idea of Scandinavia of sort of solving a lot of the uh, problems that our country hasn't been able to even begin to tackle. And it was important to see two places in which um, it had been solved and hadn't. So I really liked looking at the prisons piece that we had about Norway, which has done such a better job with incarceration than we've done in the United States. And then the piece about immigration and how I think that this is a topic that's being tackled in new ways now in Scandinavia. And I, it just made me much more interested in both of those um, dynamics within, within the countries of Scandinavia and see how, that they, how they really played out. Um, but I will tell you that I think one of my favorites is just our, our piece about uh, ice, ice swimming. I know that, you know, I'm supposed to go for the big political pieces, but I love swimming in cold water and people think I'm insane. Um, and I, I liked that it's actually something that, that we had a piece about how people do it every weekend and there's sort of the little crew that goes together and breaks up the ice and jumps in. And I, um, I, I wanted to go do that. <laughs> Okay, yeah, that I don't even take a cold shower, so I can't even <laughs> imagine that uh, piece. Yeah, and I love the piece about the welfare state in Denmark. I'm going to use that for my class that I'm teaching. Is it really about African Americans in Denmark? But what about the other people 
who are also uh, of African descent or from African nations and immigrants in Denmark, what are their experiences? So it's a great way to, to compare and contrast. Um, there's a question is about the, the coupon code for the magazine, but <laughs> are there That's, other no, questions? I think there's a question right above that, exactly to what you're saying, Atlene. It says, yes. I imagine African-Americans were more accepted in Scandinavia at that time than they were in America, especially in the Southern states. I don't know if you wanna speak a little bit to that because that's about some of the work that you're doing. Right, yeah, I cover the whole 20th century and I started in 1910 with Booker T. Washington's visit to Denmark where he was invited to meet the King and Queen of Denmark. Um, and he, he was the first African-American to have an audience with them. So most of this takes place uh, in the first half of the 20th century, before, uh, during Jim Crow, during segregation. So of course, the African-Americans were very happy to go abroad where they weren't being legally segregated. They didn't have to sit on the back of the bus. Um, even the jazz musicians, they would perform and during the breaks, they would have to sit in the back in the kitchen. They could not sit out with the audience. Uh, Marian Anderson's a famous African-American who a lot of people know the story about how she wasn't allowed to perform in America until Eleanor Roosevelt and others invited her to sing in front of the Lincoln Memorial. But she had already been in Denmark where she was so popular that the Danish government actually said, you're making too much money. You're taking too much of our funds. Uh, maybe you have to give it a rest uh, until the Danish people protested. And she actually gave some charity concerts on, on, on um, the behalf of the Danish people. And so people had a different experience. I was just shocked and surprised at how positive the experiences were for the African-Americans who went to Denmark. And like me, because this is my 15th time here in, in 10 years, uh, a lot of people couldn't really put their finger on what it was, but they just enjoyed meeting the people. They felt that they were received in such a positive way. Um, they really loved it. A lot of people made this their home or they continued to visit like me uh, almost every year, um, including uh, uh, Eugene Haynes, uh, a Juilliard classical pianist who had a hard time in the 50s and 60s being able to perform in the United States, but he was able to perform all over Europe um, because he wasn't a jazz musician. Uh, it, it was hard for him as a classical musician to get work. And so, yeah, the, I'm just fascinated by people that I've discovered who were either famous like Booker T. Washington or um, were lost to history, who just had really, really positive experiences in not just Denmark, but I focus on Denmark, but they often travel to some of the other Scandinavian nations. Um, and so, yeah, so I saw the, the little comment. Yeah, definitely. Um, it, it, it's just been a fascinating uh, a study to, to look at. Are there other questions, Kyle, or are there other ones too? I have a question for Carl Johan. Um, could you talk a little bit how the climate change is affecting the reindeer herding community at all? Um, and I know there are some issues with uh, wind farms um, and, and sort of clean energy technology that uh, is not very good for the the reindeers. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'll just have a, a, a quick comment for Kyra. Here, here is my fiance, <laughs> also mo modeling often for me. <laughs> and uh, I also wanted to connect to Andre because we have a glacier take, uh, in our main mountain back up in the my mountains called Ahka, and her glacier is melting. I was thinking about that today when it's so freaking warm right now in Jokmog is uh, 28 Celsius degrees and it's been for many days and and you know these extreme temperatures comes and goes a little bit very often and Jokmog is on the place where the uh, mean temperature rise is already above two degrees Celsius, uh, like the only place in Sweden. <laughs> so we're kind of famous, famous for that. We are already at two degrees. And to connect to the reindeer herding, it's a catastrophe. The reindeer herding won't last. I have to sad to say it won't last for very, not even for, for I don't know, the, the collapse, we're in, we're in the collapse. And I've been, since I started working, we didn't have two normal winters in a row. Uh, they're always different, always new, new ways of coping with them. <clears throat> so 
it's it's it, this is uh, this is this is the end as we know it. Can you can you tell and, us how how temperature harms reindeer? Yeah, and that's uh, of course a good question. It's still in winter time. You get uh, this warm temperature that melts the snow and creates ice crusts. So the reindeer cannot reach the lichen on the ground. It cannot dig through the ice which is on the ground. And uh, when you get these temperature differences from high to low, you create ice layers and the reindeer should eat natural food on the ground, uh, ground lichen and other stuff, but it can't reach it and it starves and spreads out because reindeer herding is based on, on natural grazing and not on, on industrial pr produced food. And, but we have to use industrial produced pellets more and more. And I feel that that's the wrong way. And also we see the green transformation as they call it in, in Sweden to transform uh, industries, uh, energy productions to more green ways. And, you know, somewhere somebody has to pay. And in, in, uh, in this case, it's the North that has to pay again. So we're already seeing the next level of kind of green colonization that transforms the landscapes into actually just industrial parks of windmills and factories mines and which will essentially wipe out reindeer herding or again <laughs> if we survive the transition of the raising temperatures so i feel that the, the green transformation that they so happily talk in sweden it's just i mean i don't know how to to even start talking about it it's such a I mean, they talk like that this will save the earth, but, but I mean, we're, we're kind of past that. And as Andrea said, we're, we're going to have to take this for hundred years of, of struggle. And all these people talking about the green transformation, they are just capitalists as we've seen them. They just rebranded themselves. I could, uh, I could cut in here. Because my previous work, Dreamland, uh, you could say that was uh, almost like a, like a post global warming. That is because uh, we have had already served our needs for clean energy in Iceland. That is, we had enough, uh, but uh, but we were kind of showing that green energy can also have the same structural power elements as the coal and oil that is of uh, disinformation and destruction and greed and short-sightedness so so we had a government that was planning to dam most of the rivers in Iceland and sell it as cheap energy to aluminum factories with the same premise that we were saving the world because otherwise they would open these factories in China but, uh, but China anyway opened their factories and nobody was really addressing the, the root of the problem, which would be energy waste, uh, resource waste, of, for example, the aluminum products. And, uh, and it is dangerous if we you know, just take the current paradigms of consumption and destruction and capitalism and, and just pretend that we can do that in a green way. Because, exactly. because because it's not possible it's and and that and also it's not simple that is yes we need to transform into we windmills and solar and etc but it can't be oversimplified and and implemented to every place everywhere uh, each place has uh, traditional landscapes that need to be protected biodiversity that uh, that green energy could destroy and uh, traditional uh, ways of living and also ownership. That is, you could also colonize people like the Sami by, by spreading windmills over their, uh, their, their land without them having any, any power or, uh, or ways of, uh, 
of uh, benefiting from from their sacrifices or 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 you know or or participating or or yeah, so it, it can become just another colonial cycle of uh, of, uh, of 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 the same that has happened for a hundred or two hundred years. So. Yeah, I just wanted to, yeah. to jump in there partly because um, I've just been translating and Andrew's Dreamland and, and sort of thinking about this a lot and the connection between Iceland and America, but also the the, the sort of debate that happened in Iceland over dams and hydroelectric is, is eerily close to something that's happening in rural communities in America now about the debate over solar and whose land, land that's already been colonized and settled, then gets given over to whose profits. Um, and I think that's actually one of the really valuable and one of the things I love about this issue and, and, and everybody's work in it, and I'm thinking of yours, especially Ethleen in Stranger's Guide, is that I feel like this is a magazine that asks us to be present in other spaces. So it's not just that we're traveling and moving, but we're actually, uh, you know, there's an awareness and a consciousness and a mindfulness. And, and, and um, you know, I think that's, that's something that we need ever more of in, in this world as we, as we hopefully come out of COVID. No, I think there's a great point. Last semester, I taught a course African-Americans uh, abroad and I focused part of it on Denmark and the American students from the Midwest uh, where I teach, uh, they were just, they were like, how come we don't know anything about Denmark? We don't see stuff in the news, probably about Scandinavia. You, you hear about Nordic you know, uh, uh, thrillers and things like that, but so much of the news in America is really focused in on the United States. And so uh, I like that about Stranger Guy is that it gave you an overview. It even said, well, what are the, the Nordic countries? A lot of people keep thinking I'm in Amsterdam. I'm like, no, that's just totally different. Um, and so I think it is very important. I'm not sure, I was just looking at time. Oh, we only have a few minutes. There was a question about Nordic identity and, 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 um, and to what degree does a Nordic region actually share an identity and who's considered Nordic? Uh, the American Scandinavian Foundation had a very good panel. I'm not saying that because I was a moderator. I was just the moderator, but the panelists were uh, black women from Iceland and Sweden and from Denmark. And they were talking about race and in uh, Scandinavia. Yeah, so what is a Nordic identity? Does, and, uh, uh, you know, we talked about the Sami, the indigenous people of the Nordic region. Is there a Nordic identity? Is that really changing? Um, that was a, a very broad question that people had. So yeah, to what degree does a Nordic region share an identity? I know it's a big question for the last few minutes if people wanna jump in. It's a, it's a huge question. Yeah. And I think, uh, like uh, you know, Carl Johan and uh, and Ethelene, you know, I think the, these people are also. Uh, I, I think we are. I think we are re-identifying ourselves because uh, because the the uh, you could say the innocence of the identity from the you know independent struggles and you know all these. Uh, um, we, our language, you know, our heritage, our history, uh, suddenly that can become like an excluding factor for, uh, for, uh, for nations that have, uh, like Icelanders are now 10% uh, Polish. You know, could we say that, uh, that part of our heritage is Marie Curie? You know, <laughs> because, because, uh, because ten percent of us is or Copernicus, because uh, because now ten percent of us is has has a root back in Poland, you know. So so we have and uh, or should we redefine ourselves as a as a nation of, uh, of refugees, because that's how we came to Iceland and settled and 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 or or not refugees, just settlers, settlers, uh, mm -hmm. as uh, people seeking a better life. So, so how do you define what is Iceland is, is, and what is to be Icelandic and what is Icelandic and, and what is healthy and what is damaging? I think that, that's a discussion that we're, we're going through now. And yeah. how open how, or how closed is, is this identity? And, and how, you know, so uh, it's a- uh, I actually, There are actually some uh, Sami names on places in, on Iceland actually, so I feel that uh, when you're talking about identity, that uh, you also have some Sami parts <laughs> in Iceland, and uh, and uh, I'm thinking about it. So that's 
the one of the only places that we kind of colonized in, in more modern times. <laughs> Are there any other questions or the, uh, the people from Strangers Die? Do you want to sum up this and, and put in a last pitch for the, the issue? I just want to end by saying to thank you for all of uh, our panelists today for both being here and talking so beautifully about your work and about the issues that we're addressing and, and for contributing to the magazine. It's been really a pleasure working with each of you. And now I'm, now you make me nostalgic that I didn't get to go and meet you all in person. So it's been wonderful talking with everyone today. Thank you very much. Um, and I believe our publisher has put in the chat where you can uh, buy Stranger's Guide. You can subscribe or order any particular issue you want on our website. Um, and I think there's a code that's also been putting there. So thank everyone. I just want to thank you all again for coming today. Thank you. And thank you to Scandinavia House for hosting us and inviting us. Thank you so much. And on behalf of Scandinavia House, I would love to thank everyone. Uh, all the panelists at Stranger Guide for uh, reaching out to us and letting us host this wonderful panel. It was a pleasure uh, and it's always wonderful to hear everyone's stories. So, um, but please do buy Stranger Guide. It's, it's a really interesting read. It's a lot, it's very diverse as you all heard about it. So um, yeah, so, uh, and we have a lot of interesting things coming up as well. So do visit the website, scandinavios.org uh, to see what we have on offer. Okay, thank you again, and I hope to see everyone soon. <laughs>